Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to give the last talk in this fantastic conference that uh, Ursula and her team have organized. Most of the conference, because we're celebrating the 200th anniversary of, of Ada Lovelace, it looks back at the history. But part of what make, uh, makes uh, Ada Lovelace very significant today is what happened over the 200 years. And uh, the fact that the information technology today so much permeates and influence on life make the contribution from 200 years ago look so significant. And therefore, I think it is apt to close this conference in looking into the future. And looking into the future, we should use Ada Lovelace criterion, which is, are we doing things for the use of mankind? So this is a, a, a wonderful quote from, and I was, I'm grateful to, to Betty Toole that uh, she closed with this yesterday and gave me a fantastic opportunity to open with it today, in which Ada Lovelace, in a letter to, to, to uh, Baba, writes, I mean, I'm shortening the far bit for me to describe the influence of ambition and fame. I wish to add my might. I presume this is a spelling of the time. She's not talking about insects. <laughs> to the, toward the most effective news of mankind, or for mankind. So the questions I want to put forward, is the technology that we are developing, is it really, ultimately, does it benefit mankind? And the lens through which I want to examine it is the lens of jobs. And uh, we are just coming out of a, of a recession that economists now call the Great Recession, which is the deepest recession we have witnessed since the Great Depression. And to appreciate the depth, to appreciate the depth of that recession, uh, you look at the plot here that shows on one dimension time from the beginning of the recession, and on the other dimension the loss of jobs. And you can see that. Uh, uh, this, this, this is the last recession we emerged out of. You can see it was the longest and the deepest since World War II. It's really, you, if you want to see something equivalent, you have to go back all the way back to the, to the Great Depression. But what I want to do here is not talk about what happened over the last few years, but to take a longer uh, look at the issue of jobs. And for that, we're going to look at what economists have been calling the Great Coupling. So what drives economic growth overall is economic productivity. And if you look uh, from, uh, from, world, from, from roughly post-World War II, from, this is from 1953, labor productivity consistently increased. And it drove, it, it produced benefit for everyone. GDP grew. And with the growth of GDP, jobs were created and income family income rose. So you see that we have, these are four separate indicators, but they kind of go up together in harmony. And they've done it over a period of, uh, of 30 years, so much so that we kind of think, well, they must go together in harmony. This is an economic law. But it turns out that this is not the case. And what's happening since uh, roughly 1980 is becoming known as the great decoupling. Because now we can see that productivity can continue to grow. And as productivity continues to grow, the economy grows. This is GDP. But somehow the benefits are not spread uniformly. You can see that uh, the, two, the two bottom lines, one is private employment. These are non-government non -government jobs, flattens. And even, even worse is median household income. To sharpen this, we can, I've, to sharpen this, if you can zoom in on this, and you can see how really things are breaking apart. And there is this phrase that uh, many economists used to believe in, that the rising tide lifts all boats. If the economy grows, everybody will benefit. And now it seems that the tide and the boat have parted company. And this is leading to a furious debate between economists, and the question is, what is causing this? So on one hand, there is something called, there's a group that called itself, or almost proudly, the Neo-Ludites. And as, as the name suggests, they blame technology. 
So bring your sons from McAfee from MIT. Productivity growth and self-employment and employment growth started to become decoupled from each other. We're creating jobs, but not enough of them. Sachs and, and Kotlikov. What if machines are getting so smart, thanks to their microprocessor brains, that they no longer need unskilled labor to operate? Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, a famous uh, New York Times columnist, can innovation and progress really hurt large number of workers, maybe even workers in general? The truth is that it can. And serious economists have been aware of this possibility for almost 200 years. These are the new Luddites. On the, on the other side, you have the people who call themselves neoclassical economists, and they say hogwash. Since the dawn of the industrial, in the industrial age, a recurrent fear has been that technological change will spawn mass unemployment. Neoclassical economists predicted that this would not happen because people will find other jobs, albeit possibly after a long period of painful adjustment. By and large, that prediction has proven to be correct. So why should think that this time it would be otherwise? And this is a natural, is the debate. The new Luddites are saying, this time it's going to be different. And the neoclassical are saying, no, why should it be different this time? So who is right? Economists cannot agree, and I'm not even an economist, so I want to take the view from computer science of this question. And to let this view, we, we go back to kind of the birth of, of artificial intelligence, attributed widely to, to Alan Turing, who in a 19, very famous uh, 1950 paper, which I think is his most cited paper, even more cited as the paper that where he introduced Turing machines. And in this paper, he discusses the questions, can machines be intelligent? Now, the paper is very famous because of the, for the Turing test. But the Turing test, in my opinion, is the weakest part of the paper. The strong part of the paper is this philosophical analysis for the feasibility of intelligent machines. And Turing comes very strongly. Yes, it is, it is a, a feasible. And he writes, I believe, that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machine thinking without expecting to be contradicted. And in the paper, he goes through all the different kinds of objections. And one of these objections came to be known as the Lovelace objection. So what is the Lovelace objection? Going back to her, her famous notes where she writes, the analytical engine has no pretension whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. And most people say, yeah, you write a program, and the program will only do what you wrote it to do. Except that Turing already understood that even if you have a program, predicting how that program will behave is impossible. And this is really the essence of the 1936 paper, that deciding how a Turing machine will behave is, not, is undecidable. And he writes, machine takes me by surprise with great frequency. Probably this argument did not occur to the countess or to Babbage. The reality is neither the countess nor Babbage actually executed programs. Anybody who wrote a program and then let it run knows it never behaves <laughs> the way you want it to behave. We are surprised every time we run a program. Now, Turing was a techno-optimist. And this techno-optimism, you, you see it very, uh, very reflected very much also in the early age of AI. 1958, Simon and Newell, within 10 years, a, a digital computer will be the world chess champion. Minsky, in 1967, within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved. Okay, generation, take it 30 years, 1997. Well, here we are, 2015. We've not quite solved it yet. <laughs> and this early optimism was followed because of the, very often, AI come with hype. Somehow it's endemic to the field. There are periods that we have been called, especially by people in the field, AI winters. And what is an AI winter? One is slow progress, but slow, slow progress we can to tolerate, but years of funding, absolutely not. <laughs> this is very bad. We should never tolerate it. And, and uh, there have been at least two kind of periods, the, the, the 70s, the late 70s, the second half of the 70s, and then mid to, and 80 to mid 90s were both periods of AI winters. But in the late 1990s, AI seemed to have turned a corner. And an event that was deeply influ influential was an IBM 
IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov in chess. Kasparov was then the, the reigning world champion, still considered by many people to be the best chess players of all times. Uh, the competition took place in uh, New York City. IBM invited me and paid travel expense and hotel expense. Couldn't say no, even though I'm not a big chess fan. And my original conception was it would be watching a, a chess game that takes several hours, would be like watching the grass grow. <laughs> but they've actually made it very interesting. And I watched the first game. And uh, in the first game, Kasparov was white, the blue was black. And even though Kasparov was in a very disadvantaged position, because while Deep Blue could study Kasparov, Kasparov had no idea how Deep Blue plays. This is a fresh player you've never seen. Nevertheless, Kasparov played a brilliant defensive game and won the game. And I remember thinking to myself, well, one day computers will win in chess, but the time has not come. And I left my wife in Texas, so I'm going to go back to Texas. And I skipped the second game. <laughs> Down. The second game, Deep Blue was white, and, and Deep Blue went on the, on, the, on the offensive and beat Kasparov. And Kasparov was so shocked psychologically that he has never recovered, and he has lost the sixth game match. So this was one milestone. And then in 2005, there is something called the DARPA Grand Challenge, which is about having autonomous vehicle drive in Death Valley. In 2004, when they did it, no car went more than, I think, seven miles. And everybody said, oh, this is too difficult. But, but in 2005, the Stanford card were able to complete 131 miles in an uncharted desert, completely autonomously. And two years later, they have the Urban Challenge. And the CMU team were able to drive 55 miles in an urban city while obeying all traffic uh, laws and avoiding hazards. And then in 2011, another really shocking milestone, I, again IBM, Watson defeats the two greatest uh, Jeopardy players of all time, uh, Brad Ratter and uh, Ken Jennings, decisively, decisively, okay? And this is, you know, answering all kind of clever, I mean, the, the questions can be very clever with puns and, and this, seemingly you really need to be intelligent. If you look at the question, it's, it's quite amazing. You can do this purely by brute force with no real somehow what we think of intelligence. And so today we see that AI is continuing to make progress. This is a, a robot called a Big Dog. And this is not new, this is 10 years old. And this is something obviously you can imagine the military would have very much would like to have mechanical mules. And you can see what happens when somebody gives it a kick and very you know, almost like a real animal, it somehow finds its balance, balance again. And we all heard now of the Google driverless car. Look, Ma, no hands. So what are the prospects? We can go back to Turing questions. What are the prospects for intelligent machinery? I would say very good. AI is making inexorable progress. You can go back at Turing, Turing analysis. It's a very compelling analysis why it's hard to argue that one cannot have intelligent machines. And there are lots of intelligent machines, except there are biological machines. And somehow they think they have made in God's image. But if you take the metaphysics out of it, we are all existent proofs that you can have intelligent machinery. Maybe silicon is not the answer. Maybe we'll find different uh, way to build machines. But there are intelligent machines. And in fact, if you just now go and uh, go to new, news.google.com and try to do a search for robots, uh, jobs, something, you see that. Every time something happens, robots are performing more and more jobs that people used to do. Being a pharmacist, the biggest challenge apparently being a pharmacist is reading the prescription. <laughs> After that, the rest is mechanical. Uh, the boning chicken that your mother used to be very proud of. 
seem to be me mechanized. I cannot do that, but it seems to be mechanized. Uh, prison guards, uh, uh, sedation, uh, bartending, more and more jobs. So today we are able to mechanize them. So the fear of intelligent machines is really, I mean, it goes back, you can find it all the way back to, in some sense, the questions, so it's a, go to the questions, what is, what is the essence of humanity? You go back to Frankenstein's and the invention of the world robot by, by, by Karl Chapek. And this is very much in the news today. In fact, just around us, Oxford has the Future of Humanity Institute. And one of the risks that they're worried about is the risk coming from strong AI. Cambridge seems to have the center for study of existential risk. And I people think of AI as, as some kind of existential risk. And we've had recently, you know, Stephen Hawkins and uh, all kind of Bill Gates. Everybody's talking about the risk from AI. But rather than think of this existential risk, I want to be much more prosaic and talk about the impact on jobs. And because we went through a recession that had such a severe impact on jobs, this really got people attention back to the concept of jobs. And in 2009, Martin Ford, uh, Ford published a book, The Light, Lights at the End of the Tunnel. And I think the metaphor has to come with when you're walking through a tunnel and you see lights at the end, is it, is it the exit light? Or are these the lights of a truck coming towards you? <laughs> and so he writes, is it possible that accelerating computer technology was the primary cause of the current global economic crisis and that even more disruptive impacts lie ahead? When the book came out, it did not receive much, much attention. Partly, he's not a brand name. He doesn't come from an institution with a pedigree. He a, was, a, was a software uh, entrepreneur. But in 2012, two really blue chip economists, Bryn Olson and McAfee from MIT, published a book, The Race Against the Machine. And there they made the case very powerfully, technological progress is accelerating innovation, even as it leaves many types of workers behind. And so now the debate between the new Luddites and the new classical is raging on. And the new Luddites are marshalling a huge amount of data on their side. So I want to spend a few minutes just going through hardcore economic data. So one of the things is, is manufacturing. This is, this is US data. And we all heard how all of manufacturing went to China. China is doing all the manufacturing. And manufacturing in the United States somehow has been destroyed. Turns out, this is completely false. If you look at manufacturing volume, and here you see data from 1950 till 2010, of course, it's zig, it zig and zag, but the general trend, it goes up all the time. The US is a manufacturing giant, but employment peaked somewhere around 1980. It's since then, it's been going down. And I think, okay, all the jobs have gone to China. If I will put here the Chinese data, you're going to do something similar, except what you'll see is that the peak of manufacturing employment is not in 1980, but is maybe around 2005, and then it peaked. And now it's going down also in China. Uh, the US always pride, pride itself on being, as opposed to Europe, a job creation machine. And in fact, if you look at the, at the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, the US really generated many, many jobs. But then you see how the job, the job machine start to slow down around 1980. So it goes down to 20% in the 1980s. Another 20% in, in, in the 1990s. No, actually, job, if you look at the, at the period, the first decade of the, of the 21st century, the whole decade, net job losses. Overall, between the boom and the bust and the recession, we have not created new jobs in the United States. Now, a couple of years ago, Piketty's book came out. Assume that uh, if you are working on this planet, you've heard of Piketty's book. And so the cause of inequality is now a very hot political topic. And so you can see that either if you look at income, then you can see the top 1% is, is way up there compared to everyone else. Or if you look at share of income, you see the same picture. And of course, the numbers always zig and zag, especially at the top. The, the, the people top 1% are much more, in fact, sensitive to the economy in terms of, in terms of percentage than the people at the bottom. But you can see that, that in particular, at the... If you look at the share of income, you see the zigzag, but you see the only the top 10% are gaining. Everybody has lost in share of income. 
Now, I assume that most of us think, think of ourselves as the 99%, and then we're looking way up there and we see the 1%. But even if you, are the, even if you slice it into the 1%, you see the same phenomenon. So here you see the bottom 90% is just flat line there, right? Above it, you see the top 1%. Above it, you see the top point 0.1%. And way above it, you see the point oh one percent. So even within the one percent, the people there can complain about the top one percent of the top one percent. <laughs> uh, if you look at the economy, the period of the economy contracts and expands. And when it expands, you can see okay, where do the benefit go when the economy expands? And you can see that in earlier period, most of the benefits when to the bottom 90%. But you can say this is decreasing. And now most of the benefits go to the top 10% when the economy grows. Now you could say, well, you know, this is class, class war. Why are you complaining? Because other people are doing better. Just focus on what you have. And if other people get richer, what's the big deal? Turns out that you can tie inequality to all kinds of problems in society. For example, social mobility. We would like to think that maybe not everybody is born equal, but everybody is born with equal opportunity. And so economists measure how easy it is to people to, people to move between econ different economic or socioeconomic strata. And it turns out that when you have higher inequality, you have lower mobility. So you can see here, for example, that uh, the US and Spain have very high inequality and very low mobility. And the Scandinavian country at the other end have lower inequality and much higher mobility. A higher inequality means lower growth. Again, you can see the, the points are all over the place. But generally, if you have higher inequality, then you can see that economic growth is slower. The middle class, which is considered to be the main stem of, of, of liberal society, of democratic society, you can see, how, and that's roughly the, the, the middle third of income, you can see how over the starting of 1971, how the middle class is gradually shrinking. Typically, when we look at unemployment, we, the question that we're asking, how many people are looking for a job and are not finding jobs? But more significant is economists measure what percentage of the people, 25 and, and, and older, are actually working. And you can see that in 1980, it was over 90, over 80% of the people over 25 were working. And now, now these numbers are going down. And now it's somewhere around 75%. Fewer and fewer people are working. So if they're not working, what are they doing? Again, we see wages versus GDP. It goes down. Long-term unemployment. People who are employed, I think, more than two years. You see, again, it zigzags, but overall, this number keeps going up. More and more people are unemployed for more than, more than two years. So we saw all these economic indicators that tell us that something wrong happened in the economy over the past 30 years. What exactly happened? But because, because these, are hard, this is hard, these are hard economic uh, uh, data points, in, in 2013, Gartner, which is a very mainstream business-oriented consulting company, they write a report, and the title is Smart Machines Will Have Widespread and Deep Business Impact Through 2020. So this is now, you cannot, it's not just the, the communists that argue that this is, this is a Gartner, very, very reputable company, and they write most business and thought leaders underestimate the potential of smart machines to take over millions of middle-class jobs in the coming decades. Job destruction will happen at a faster pace. And, and uh, in a 2014 a poll among about 1,000 uh, active economists, and they posed to them the question, the, the thesis is information technology and automation are a central reason why media majors have been stagnant in the United States over the past decade, despite rising productivity. Among the 1,000 economists, about 43% agree, 30 are uncertain, 25% disagree, only 4% strongly disagree. That means you have over 70% think that it's actually quite possible that this uh, economic uh, situation is caused by information technology. 
And now, you know, I kind of follow the, the newspaper all the time to see what they say about it. These are now titles from, from the mainstream media, and you'll find them now on, on a regular basis. More jobs, are more jobs predicted for machines, not people. Will robots steal your job? Marathon machines, men versus machine, robots are winning, the rights of the robots. This is from last year. This is the cover of The Economist magazine. Very solid, very business-oriented magazine. This is the cover. The right, and the, 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 the issue is, the theme of the issue is the rise of the robots. So, is this time going to be different? So, it is true that if you go back to, to the beginning of the industrial revolutions, a technological change always destroyed, destroyed some kind of jobs, but it also created new jobs. So, what's different this time? What's different this time that we are working, and the computer scientists here are working on building machines, and the goal is to build machines that will be able to outcompete us in anything that we can do. I mean, just think, Im imagine that we are extremely successful. Right now, where, where, is, uh, where are AI and information technology and robots, where are challenged? We cannot yet emulate the physical dexterity and the situational awareness of, of uh, people or even animal, okay? Just take a, a, a juggler and think of the, the eye-hand coordination of a juggler. We, don't, we, do not have, we cannot yet do it uh, with machines. And we cannot yet do with machines the high-level cognition that is required in many, many jobs. But there are many, many jobs that do not require such a physical dexterity on one hand and do not require high-level cognition on the other hand. Just as you go about your day, look at the jobs around you and to think, okay, what kind of intelligence and physical dexterity they require? And that's why more and more of the jobs are being automated. So just uh, last month, a study came up here from Oxford, and they looked at the question is, okay, technology destroys jobs, is technology also creating new jobs? So they want to look at it. What are the new jobs? And they found, they wanted to know between 2000, they look at the United States, and they asked themselves in 2010, what percent of jobs in 2010 were jobs that did not exist in 2000? And the answer is, Half a percent. It's not as if there is this massive job engine. I mean, IBM still probably has about 400,000 employees. IBM is so-called IT legacy company. Facebook is the new company. How many employees does Facebook have? I think it's under 10,000 employees. And so the new, the, the new technology is simply not creating these kind of jobs that we, would, we need them to create to keep the economy humming. And it was very useful to imagine a conversation between horses somewhere around the beginning of the century. <laughs> so one horse is a pessimist. He's watching the Model T coming out. He says, oh my God, now they have horseless carriages. They have this automobile, what we call now call autonomous car. They call it automobile. We have this automobile and they have all this far machinery. What will happen to horses? And uh, the other horse is an optimist. He's a neoclassical neo horse. <laughs> and he says, look, yes, technology always dis destroys jobs for horses, but technology always creates new jobs for horses. <laughs> Don't, not to worry. There will be jobs for horses as far as we can imagine. As it happens, 1915 was the peak employment, so to speak, for horses. Of course, for horses, if you don't have a job, why should you exist, okay? You are consuming resources. So today, horses exist mostly, with few exceptions, as pets, okay? And so fortunately for horses, they found a niche employment, <laughs> being a pet. And so it turns out that all this argument to say, don't worry, technology will create new jobs for people, completely analogous, you can say, they will create new jobs for horses. So the question, I think, Really, to me, it's, it's, it's one of the most fundamental questions I can, I can think of about the future of humanity, going beyond this, uh, what happened when AI takes over, something much more prosaic, something coming out in much in the, in the near future. If machine can, can do all the work, or almost all the work, or even 50% of the jobs that, uh, that we used to do, what will people do? 
Now, you know, the, some of the, some of the of other analy analyses go back to what will happen in 100 years and 200 years. Predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Also, um, for many of us, 100 years is a bit beyond our imagination. It's, it's our great, great grandchildren. It's a bit too hard to wrap your brain around it. But if you think about 30 years, 30 years is... We can imagine we are in, 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 in 1985 and we are making a projection for the next 30 years. And if, you are not, if we don't think we're going to be around in 30 years, we think our children are going to be around, our grandchildren are going to be around. 30 years is something that we're concerned about. One of the problems with global warming is it's going to happen around 2100. But 30 years, he says, this is almost, it's, it's coming. So let's talk about what happened in 30 years. So, People try to come up with many answers, including, including, you know, we will immigrate to other planets, which is probably at this point seems like a fanciful answer. But the most common answer is, wow, actually what you're describing is a wonderful future. We won't have to work anymore. We'll have new type of slaves, we'll have robots, they do all, all the work. We'll be able to engage in meaningful leisure activities. This is, this is, the, this is the leisure answer. So there are really two issues, big issues with this. One is we will need a huge economic adjustment to move to a world from the current economy that we have. This is over 30 years. 30 years is not a long time for a huge economic change. If you look, for example, at the industri industrial uh, uh, revolution. So it started in the, really in the 17th century. When have we fully adjusted to the industrial revolution? And I would argue that the full adjustment to the industrial revolution is the creation of the modern social democratic states with a social safety network. And then when, that, when does that happen? Really? Post-World War II. So it actually took us 200 years at least to adapt to, to the Industrial Revolution. And now we're talking about changes going to unfold in 30 years. So just economically adapting to it, I think, is, is going to be very, very challenging. Just have to imagine what happened if we saw that uh, Labor participation rate is, is dropping down to now it's about 75%. What happens when it gets to 50%? 50% of the people are not working and continue to drop. But beyond the economic issue, I think there is a deep philosophical question. What is the meaning of the good life? And the good life is a philosophical term that goes back to the classical uh, uh, Greek philosophers. They wanted to know what is the life worth living. And in fact, there are some periods in history that people did not work for a living. If you go back, there were some periods in the Roman Empire where either you were a patrician and you had a lot of money, or the slaves were doing all the work, and the Flebian were somehow subsidized bread and entertainment. And that seems to me a dystopia. <laughs> Turn out that these questions, which is what will people do if they don't have to work, was raised in a beautiful play by Theodor Herzl. So if you've heard of Theodor Herzl at all, you may have heard of him as the founder of modern uh, political Zionism. But he was a writer, and he wrote a, a play in 1904 called Solon, Solon in Lydia. So Solon is an Athenian statement, and he is perceived to be, a, everybody thinks he's very, very wise. So the Athenian asked him to devise a new legal system, and he writes a new legal code. He said, you must follow it for 10 years. You cannot change it for 10 years. And he knows the adjustment will be hard, so he leaves Athens for 10 years. And he goes to visit Lydia. Lydia is a very rich kingdom uh, ruled by Crassus. We still say, say today, rich as Crassus. And he, Crassus arrives at, at Lydia, and Crassus says, oh, thank you for coming here. I can use your wisdom. I need some advice. This young inventor called Eucosmos invented a way to make flour without actually having to raise uh, the wheat. So. I'm trying to figure out how I should reward you, Cosmos. I'm thinking of giving my daughter to him as a, for his wife. And, and Solon said, no, 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 to the contrary. You should kill him. <laughs> and uh, Cosmos says, you're out of your mind. This is a wonderful invention. People don't have to work. I need to reward him. Get out of here. I don't want to listen to your advice. OK, he says. So uh, you, Cosmos, is given permission to go and deploy his new invention. So now you can get, uh, you can get uh, a, a, a flour for free. My guess is the women still have to work to make bread out of the flour, but the men did not have to work anymore. So the men became lazy and restless, 
and so they get impatient and they start uh, complaining about everything. They became quarrelsome, and eventually they start, they start uh, complaining about Crassus, and uh, there is a rebellion actually uh, kind of uh, growing in the ranks of the, of the population. And so the, again, there is an urgent meeting in the palace with Crassus and Eucosmos and Solon. And Solon says to Eucosmos, well, Eucosmos, you're still of the opinion that you can make the people happy. You hear the commotion down there. Do you want them to, to still to have bread without worry, without work? And he gives them a chalice of poisoned wine. Because it's not enough that you stop your, your invention. It's in your head. People get it out of you. The only way to destroy this invention is for you to kill yourself. And he said, drink it for the welfare of mankind. And your cosmos drinks the wine. This is, this is the end of the play. So, so this is really the question. If machines can do everything, almost everything that humans used to do, what will humans do? Now, Turing, in his paper, which is all about the possibility of machine intelligence, he's actually very excited about the, the possibility of, of uh, machine intelligence. He writes, we may hope that machine will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields. We can see plenty that there needs to be done. So he's like a, a researcher, say, wow, there's going to be lots of funding, lots of opportunities. This is great. And there is no trace in the paper of any worry about what the implications of this means, any notion of social responsibility. Is this a good direction to go to? Now, I think this is comparable to probably the, the biggest technological change. The, the, the essence of the, of the Industrial Revolution is that we found a source of energy which is not either uh, human labor or animal labor. And this has enabled us to live, if we look how we live today, I mean, it's just incomparable to the way people lived, you know, 300 years ago. This has liberated us from labor in such, a, in such a way. And now we all realize that we're paying the price with climate change, and how to get off the, off the, off the fossil fuel uh, train is incredibly hard, you know? Now there's a Paris meeting, there was a Tokyo meeting, the Copenhagen meeting, they come and go, and uh, we, we have as a society incredibly hard time dealing with the change when it's about to happen. Maybe this time we need to think it before it happens, not after it already happened. In closing, I want to again quote Brin Olson and McAfee. And they say, there is no economic law that says that everyone, or even most people, automatically benefit from technological change. There's no economic law. It happened over the 300 years. We don't know what's causing the current turmoil in the economy. There is a very good possibility that it is caused by technology. <laughs> Richard uh, Mernan and Frank Levy, two researchers from Harvard, wrote a beautiful report called Dancing with Robots, trying to think of how we'll adjust to, to a, a society. And I, I'm using robots and AI as a metaphor for generally for computing technology in all, in its, all, all of its forms. And they write, the central domestic policy change challenge of the 21st century is how to ensure middle class prosperity and individual success in an era of over-intensifying globalization and technological upheaval. Nigel Cameron, in a, in a very nice article, I think summarized it very succinctly. Will a world without work be heaven or hell? Now is the time to think it through. Thank you very much. <laughs>